here at the MGA offices and we're with the newly appointed Motor Gaming Authority CEO, Carl Brinkart. And I'm excited to know a little bit better who Carl Brinkart is and who we're going to have with us for the next number of years as CEO. Thank you for having us for this very first interview uh, that you're giving as CEO. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, Amar. Let's jump right to it. A lawyer by profession. How long have you been working in this industry and uh, specifically with the Motor Gaming Authority? Well, they're the same time frames. I, I jumped into the industry by coming to the MGA. I've been at the MGA for just over six and a half years now. I joined in 2014 and as a legal officer. And then as, the, as time went by, I, I continued uh, developing within the organization. Was it always your, let's say, your aspiration to uh, be heading this, um, uh, this authority as, as, a, as a student, as a legal student, no, as a, no, as a law student? Not at all, to be honest. Uh, so how, where, where did it change? How did it all morph? I am very much a, a lawyer, by, by a lawyer, both by profession and insofar as my, my professional uh, aspirations are concerned. Um, however, there came a point where I said the best way for me to contribute to the organization, I felt, would, have, would be to apply for the position of CEO. And that is where I started. I started thinking about it. Uh, as a chief officer before, and a member of the various committees of the MGA, uh, part of what gave me great satisfaction was to drive change within the organization and to make improvements for the benefit of the country and the industry at large. And I felt that the best way to continue doing that would be to apply for the position of CEO. Yeah, in fact, um, you've been with the MGA for quite, quite some time now. And the government, I'd say, I would personally say rightly so, decided to uh, opt someone from within the authority and rather than going for someone from outside. Uh, not only from Mota, but also from outside Mota. There, there were also options to go for that. Um, do you think uh, the government wants more of the same, more continuity, or are you here to rock the boat? Well, uh, I think it, it's a mixture of both. So part of, part of what I, I told the, the selection committee during the evaluation process is that, uh, yes, I, I, want, I want a level of continuity. There have been a considerable number of changes within the MGA in the past, in the past few years. Uh, a lot of senior management has moved on. And I feel that a certain level of continuity within the organization is necessary. That does not mean that changes will not be made. So uh, everyone has their style, um, I, I think, and, and everyone has a style that they suit to the particular time in which they are heading the MGA. Yeah. So, at the, so although, yes, continuity, but at the same time, certain improvements that need to be made, certain tweaks um, are, are already ongoing, actually. In fact, you're talking about styles. Um, as Sigma, we remember the MGA uh, run by, let's say, different personalities, from Ruben Portanier to Mario Gallia, then over to Joe Kushkiri, and uh, more recently to Heathcliff Farruja. And I can tell you, they all have different leadership styles. What are you bringing to the table? As Carl Brinkart. Well, as CEOs, I remember Joe Kushkiri and Heathcliff. Uh, I do not remember Mario and Ruben, although I, I know them quite well now through the industry, obviously. How, how do you see what, what's, what was unique about each and uh, what are you bringing new to the table? I, th I think in certain elements, they were, they were very similar to each other. So the way they wanted to drive change within the organization, their focus on, on operational optimization. Uh, and in certain case, in certain other things, they were they were very different. Um, during, but also as I mentioned, depends on the time as well. So during Joe's time, the MGA was perhaps more focused on growth. Um, during Heathcliff's time, as was required, uh, we started focusing even more on on compliance. Uh, I am going to be a bit of a balance between the two. So reputation is extremely important for for the jurisdiction, for the industry, and for us as a regulator. So that cannot be prejudiced. So that is something that we will continue to build on. At the same time, uh, it's important that we make sure that Malta is a, a place for sustainable growth of the industry. So a bit of a balance between the two. To warm up a bit of a conversation, I'm going to throw a number of keywords at you and I would like your instant 
reaction. Maybe it's one word, maybe it's a short sentence. Remember, it's Monday morning, huh? so instant <laughs> might be stretching it a bit. Casino or sports betting? Sports. Sports. Biggest market potential? Asia, Africa, or Latin America? Asia, if you can manage to be compliant. Daily fantasy sports? A kind of subset of sports betting eventually. Esports? The future. Banking? A problem. COVID-19? A very big problem globally, but also a driver of change. Blockchain? The technological future. Crypto? Will become one more payment method. Artificial intelligence? Well, instant is not the case here. Um, something which the industry has been an early adopter of and will continue to drive the adoption of globally, I think. Virtual reality, VR? Not as important as AR, I think. AR can be the future of land base. And finally, anti-money laundering, AML. Extremely important, also very costly. Um, so we'll continue to develop as, as the years go by, I think. Thank you. The industry seems to have led by example, right, during the pandemic. Um, we see offices who have taken the lead before government even announced uh, certain measures to, to let their employees work from home. They even pay them extra to cover air condition bills, to cover coffee bills. Um, how has this um, impacted the industry? I mean, uh, that you have the gaming industry taking such a lead and leading by example is surely a good thing. Yes, um, absolutely. How have you monitored the situation and then what can you comment about? I, I think the industry has proven, first of all, that it is resilient and as always innovative. So be it uh, with regards to people working from home and the measures to facilitate people working from home, um, the fact that they have put the workers' health first um, from the very initial stages of the pandemic, which is laudable, but also how it has adapted to the economic changes, how it has adapted to, for example, how sports betting operators adapted to the suspension of sports competitions. Um, so I think w the way the industry has reacted to the pandemic is very much a testament to the fact that aside from being a very big challenge, it's also a driver of change. We continued monitoring. So as MGA, we conducted, um, we conducted a number of studies. We looked into the information that was being supplied to us by the operators in order to monitor their difficulties. We advised government on measures that may, need, that may require, um, that the industry may require in order to weather the storm. So that is how we kept, we kept our finger on the pulse of the industry during this time. And, and have there been restrictions imposed then by the regulator, by MGA? Rather and than, how was the response by the B2Cs and the B2Bs? Rather than restrictions, what we did was uh, we clarified that the pandemic should not be used in any way in order to uh, either encourage What's a certain number you? of sports, of, sorry, of bets um, on the results of the pandemic itself and uh, that operators need to be careful how they market their services to people who may be more vulnerable now with the circumstances of the pandemic. I, the operators um, responded very well to it. Uh, there, there were a number of enforcement measures that had to be, that so had to be carried out, obviously. You have but had to overall, use the, the stick yes. at, at some point. But overall, how, were, how has the response been? Overall, I think the response has been has been very good. And I cannot but mention that a number of operators were actually proactive and put measures in place before the MGA has issued guidance on this. Numbers, number of licensees, and uh, have you had to break it down? I think it's important for, um, for the industry out there to, to acknowledge. Around 300. The responsiveness. Uh, and uh, licensees overall, yo. Yeah. Overall, around 300 licensees, 90-ish of which are B2Bs. Okay. And uh, when you say you had to enforce Ten. using the stick, okay. So a fraction of... No, only a fraction. So, and, and the stick is always important because if you don't use it, you're not being fair to the compliant operators, which were by far the vast majority. Thank you, Carl. I'm very excited to be working with you. That brings us to an end of part one of a three-part series.
Look forward to part two next week. Thank you.